But those platforms don't look very safe. Be careful. I don't know how I'd manage without you. Why are there saws here? It makes no sense. Did you see that saw? I saw the saw. Nearly there, concentrate. As we sat waiting for the helicopter to pass, we continued chatting. I told Fort about everything that had happened to me, about my quest to clean a million things, about my friends and about everything that had happened on the moon. All I want now is to go home, I said. You can come to my home, said Fort. I'm on the run but it's pretty safe there. When I asked Fort why he was on the run, he told me about everything that had happened to him, how after the nice virus there would be no more war and therefore no need for most soldiers. Soldiers like him. As my model was designed to destroy other robots, we were built with an incredibly powerful core, he said. There was no way to disarm us. So we were put to death. Because of our power, the only way we could be detonated was deep underwater, miles out at sea. Even then it caused huge explosions. But while we were waiting to get on the boat, I just sort of ran off. As soon as the helicopter had gone Fort said, Let's move. Here we go. Jump on the spot in the sand so you don't sink. Have you got a spare rocket pack? Nice one, Giza. This used to be used for archaeology surveys. We're very exposed up here. Some things were worth less junk, but this could be sold for a decent price. Fort said that it would be best if we waited in this building. 
the helicopter still sounding nearby, and we were in no massive rush. We soon got chatting again, Fort explained how the robot call had happened very quickly. It was a matter of days after the nice virus hit, every robot that was deemed unnecessary was destroyed, even harmless ones, it was considered logical and for the greater good, he said. I wasn't sure what to say, I didn't think we could raise an army to fight the man in black, but I supposed I'd hoped we could do something to defend ourselves by the time they returned to Earth. As Fort filled the bird's dishes with food, I asked him why he carried them with him. They can't fly anymore so I feel kind of protective of them, he said, we found them in a bombed out building. It was so nice how he cared for them. I smiled and asked him their names. This is Barry, and this little lady is Alice. I don't know why I picked those names. But I knew why, and it made me smile. When we found them, they were badly hurt. But my friend, she nursed them back to health. I asked him where his friend was now. But Fort just looked at the floor and said, The helicopter must be gone by now. Gotta help me take the gunship down. I'm not a soldier anymore. The killer instinct is still inside you deep down. in the past. I can't do this without you. I've got an idea. Get me some fuel. That's her. Wearing her favorite dress, said Fort. She was a concierge robot, classy, intelligent, and designed to serve man. But when all the men were gone, just like me, she wasn't needed anymore. Fort sighed, and gently placed the photo back on the shelf. I thought I would try to cheer him up. Looking around the room, I saw a battered old piano and thought I would try playing the tune Heather had taught me.
I told Vought how great I thought his house was, and I truly meant it. Vought I knew I needed to get back to my quest. However, things soon got serious when I mentioned my gloves and shoes. Do you mean the magic shoes of gravity defiance, Fort asked, and Atlas gloves of mighty strength? They sounded far grander when he described them, but I was pretty sure he meant the same things. The sacred artifacts, Fort said, but before I could reply he burst into an explanation about how there were certain things from some kind of half-remembered time that the robot rulers considered sacred and holy. I used to believe in it all, the words, the prophecies, I even believed in the Chosen One, said Fort. But after she... Well, I just couldn't swallow all the ghost stories and the nonsense about the afterlife. You know what I mean buddy. I didn't know about the afterlife, or the Chosen One, but I knew ghosts were real. I then began to explain how Mr. Preston had told me the story about how Mrs. Silton had told him a story about the brother of a man who works with her uncle giving a young motorcyclist to lift after a crash outside the Black Wall Tunnel. He pulled up outside the motorcyclist's destination, but when the man turned around, the motorcyclist had vanished. So he knocked on the door and an old woman answered. When he asked her if she had a son, the woman burst into tears and said I did, but he died in a motorcycle accident exactly ten years ago, just outside the Black Wall Tunnel. And so we began a conversation that would take us long into the night. I shared the various philosophies that the old man had taught me, about life, the universe and Douglas Adams. While Fort explained the robot philosophies, how there was a yearly competition to find the Chosen One, how they and only they would deserve the sacred artifacts and how they would rule the world. It all sounded so grand. But I suppose I was tired. I'd be happy now if I could just sit and play some video games. Eventually Fort stood up. Well, it's late, he said. I need to recharge. How are your batteries? I honestly had no idea how my batteries were, so I smiled and said, I'll be fine here thanks. I'll do it, was the first thing I said to Ford in the morning. Do what? Came his reply with a strange look. So I explained how I would enter this Chosen One contest, get these sacred shoes and gloves, then we would return home and defend the planet from the man in black. Who will buddy? Asked Ford. Me and you? He had a point but I knew Heather and the rest of my friends would help. Maybe it was the talk that Fort and I'd had, maybe it was the dream I had last night, or maybe it was just the urge to get home and make sure everyone was safe, but I suddenly felt like I could save the world. Come on then buddy, said Fort, show me what you've got. If you're going to win the contest, you'll have to be good.
Ford leant back with a big smile. It's a long way, he said, to the contest I mean. It'll take us months to walk to the robot capital. We had best get going. Again, on Fort's suggestion, we mainly traveled at night. Even though the world was such a mess, the twilight still made everything look quite beautiful. We took refuge in another bombed out building, with Fort deciding when it was time to move again. We spent the next few months traveling like this until eventually, we made it to the robot capital city. Fort had told me how the capital used to be a human city. But after the war, the robots had more than taken over. However, I didn't expect a literal cathedral of video games. I joined the queue and signed up for the tournament as soon as I could. I'll be over there buddy, good luck, said Fort as he found a seat with some huge agricultural robots and attempted to blend in. Before the competition began, the host spoke of many rules, laws and grand philosophies, comparing life to various video games. It sort of reminded me of Alice's church, but with none of the warmth or compassion. But still everyone clapped. There were to be three rounds to the competition. With a choice of two games per round, the player with the highest score would win, and advance to the next round. I won the coin toss, so it was my decision which game we played. Play a short song and score as many points as you can. I was shocked to discover that it was actually a tournament to the death, 
all the losers of round one were placed into a crusher, myself included. Luckily my Lazarus chip took me back far enough to start again. Play a short song and score around it. Ladies and gentlemen, your round one winners. Well done, said Fort. I knew you could do it, buddy. Round one was in the bag, but now it was time to meet my opponents for round two. Shoot everything and score them as many points as you can. Ladies and gentlemen, these four are your semi-finalists. Fort smiled as I stepped off the stage, but neither of us said anything. We were too focused on winning. Shoot everything and score them as many. It was quite horrible but I, and the other loser of round 3, soon found ourselves inside a crusher. But, my own personal cheat code kicked in, as my Lazarus chip took me back far enough. Shoot everything and sc
try to score as many points. So here we have it, these two are our ultimate competitors. They will now fight it out in the final round. Cover the level with ectopath. Everyone cheered. The host even declared me the winner. But then, for some reason, a videotape which contained a better score than mine was presented. I was then informed that I would have to play my opponent again, but now on a mystery game. It seemed a little unfair, but I guess it was supposed to be some kind of tiebreaker.
some shadowy robots forced me into a crusher. So for once it didn't feel like cheating when my Lazarus chip kicked in. Some shadowy robots forced me into a crusher. So for once it didn't feel like cheating when my Lazarus chip kicked in. Finally won round 4, and thus the whole competition. However, unknown to me but seemingly well known to everyone else, there was more to come. As I walked forwards, I heard a voice reciting a poem. To see a world in a grain of sand, and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Show me your mark, demanded the yellow machine. I would have done as he said but I had no idea what he meant. The machine sighed, your serial number. Who are you robot? To me, the number had always looked unimpressive, but it clearly meant something to this machine. For several minutes he called me things like, the firstborn, the chosen light, the cleanser of the world. And of course, literally, the one. No matter, said the machine when he finally composed himself. Before you can take the artifacts, we must play. The game. Winner stays on.
you of all people should know. This contest was conceived after we won the war. To find the greatest robot. To find the one. I beat my predecessor and he beat his. However, I have an advantage. The humans broadcasting their nice virus wasn't the first time I had felt the sweet sting of life. Long before then I briefly worked in a seaside arcade. However, I was recalled in 1974 when my AI was deemed too great for the general public. No one could beat me then. And no one can beat me now. can't win. Have you got some kind of power up? I was better than you on my first boot up. Have you got some kind of power up? Have you even played this game before? Stop doing that. Have you got some kind of power up? Sometimes my conquered opponent has to be coaxed into submission, said the machine. Some by force, some by bribery, some just need a few simple words. But I understand my fate. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground, and swallows circling with their shimmering sound, and frogs in the pools singing at night and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire. Why haven't you done it? The button is right there. My soul is yours to take. But killing him was the last thing I wanted to do. So I asked him why should I? Because, he replied, this is the way things are, this is the way things have always been. So everyone wants to win this game, so they can sit in a dark cave waiting to play the game again? Things will have to change.
And so, I was crowned by the grace of God, defender of the faith and ruler of the known world. I gave many rousing speeches to my new nation, and, when I told the machine about the moon and the man in black's army, he discussed with the council of nine advisers and assured me everything would be taken care of. I had won the sacred tournament, so I and I alone had the right to wear the magic shoes of gravity defiance. The only trouble was, they didn't really work. I mean they were fine as a pair of shoes, but I could no longer run up walls, but I guess this didn't really matter anymore as one of the many perks of being the ruler of the known universe, was that I could have everything I ever wanted.